Morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ Sunday uh, service. And remember that if you're watching this online, that you need your Bible, your sermon outline, unleavened bread, some grape juice, so that you can follow along with us and worship at home if you can't come. Remember, our goal is not to give you a permanent stay away from the assembly, but is to make you more comfortable so that you can come. We also still have our parking lot uh, service that, that you can come to while while this is going on. We broadcast it toward the parking lot. So those of you who still don't feel quite comfortable can sit in your car. But we do want you to come and have fellowship with God's people. We believe that's really important uh, uh, as God's people. Um, we're glad that all of you are here and pray that the Lord continues to bless each and every one of you. There will be We Worship today. Brother Sandy's here. I believe they're going to be studying the Cain and Abel. Uh, and if not, uh, he can tell you what it is they're studying. Um, and so Brother Bill's going to be leading us in our song service. Our first song is number 434. Uh, all of our songs, if you're in the auditorium or on the overhead, if you can't see the song, there are song books underneath your pew or underneath your chair. And if not, just raise your hand and somebody will get them for you. Also, make sure you have the communion cup with you and so that when communion comes by, you'll be ready. If you don't, just raise your hand and, and uh, we'll, be, we'll make sure and get you that. Good to see all of you here. Everybody sit up straight and let's praise God together. Brother Bill. I have some good news for you. A couple of weeks ago, I told you that I failed to clicker 101. Uh, I got formal training on Wednesday. So when I'm not needing singing, I'll be... I'll be your new clicker. <laughs> clicker operator. <laughs> Whatever that means. Uh, anyway, I appreciate Mike for, and I appreciate your patience with me. We, we missed the PowerPoint on one entire sermon because I couldn't get the clicker to work. <laughs> so, <clears throat> my apologies for that, but hopefully that will be resolved. The songs this morning are geared toward uh, the lesson, which is part one, the nature of Jesus' kingdom. And from my studies in the Bible, the kingdom of Jesus is all about service. So some of these songs have the word kingdom mentioned in them. Some of them have service mentioned. So they go hand in hand, from my estimation. I may learn differently this morning. All hail the power of Jesus' name. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the Oh, God. 
studying Ephesians 5, where Paul writes, making melody in your heart. Uh, the older I get, the more I appreciate the fact that he didn't say make melody with your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> because my mouth and my throat are not cooperating this morning. <coughs> and it's allergies. So, uh, to continue our uh, the theme of our song service, page 564, Follow Me. <coughs> I travel down a lonely road and no one seems to care. The burden on my weary back has got me to despair. I often complain to Jesus how folks were treating me. And then I heard him say so tenderly. give thanks to the to you, Lord, to sing praises to your name, uh, the Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night. And with uh, the ten strings lute, with the, with the harp, with resounding music upon the lyre, for you, O Lord, you have made uh, me glad for what, from what you have done. I will sing for, sing for joy at the works of uh, your hands. How great are your works, O God. Your thoughts are very deep. Uh, we thank you, God, for, for your thoughts being on us this morning and being in this place with us. Uh, we thank you for, uh, for ju just giving us the breath in our lungs, for giving us um, 
the health that we have to be here. We know that there are those who are not fortunate enough to be here with us this morning. And, and we pray your healing hands would be upon them, that, that your blessings would be with them, and your promises uh, would comfort them. We pray that you'd bring them back together with us, Lord, and that you would um, you would ease all of the pain and, and the discomfort and the, the fears and the troubles that we have uh, that, that come up in this life uh, that we all struggle with, uh, that we all uh, need you for, Lord. We need to uh, give them up to you. We need to to worry not, but to um, to allow you to to work on our hearts, to, to change our perspective, to to see this life uh, and our lives and our purpose here from, from your eyes, Lord, um, and not just uh, in the, the midst of the problems, in the midst of the storm. Uh, help us to look out upon the waves of that storm and see your son Jesus walking on the water and help us to have the faith uh, that, your, that your disciples had to step out of the boat and to to trust you, Lord, and to, to walk towards you in the midst of the storm. Uh, give us that faith and give us that, uh, that, that boldness uh, to, to be uh, surrounded by your love and to, and to trust you. Uh, we pray, God, that you would uh, bless this hour of worship uh, this morning as we raise our, our voices to you, as we sing songs together, as we, um, as we draw near to you, God. Uh, we pray that we would all feel you drawing near to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Those who may be visiting us with us for the first time, this is that part of service where we are commanded to commune with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who suffered, bled, and died, and most of all, resurrected for the sins of this world. We have an example that we use is 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, beginning with the 23rd verse. <clears throat> and it reads, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At this time, shall we together stand, those who are able? And let us give, partake of the bread. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh dam unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. At this time let us partake of the cup. Every first day of the week, we are also commanded to show our stewardship for the things that God has uh, provided for us. In this particular case, our money's income that he has blessed us with. We use as one of our references, 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verses number 6. For this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man has a purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. This time, let us give as we have been prospered, and let us both give thanks for the bread and the cup as well as I forgot to pray for it. Father in heaven, we thank you for the bread which symbolizes your son's broken body and his shed blood. We're thankful for this opportunity to come together at this place to worship thee. And we thank you for sparing our lives and giving us the opportunity to have a op opportunity to e eternal life. We thank you for these emblems and we pray that we took them with clean hands and pure hearts. It's in Jesus' name we ask all things. Amen. Amen. <coughs> this morning, growing in God's kingdom, whosoever shall 
give a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple shall in no wise lose his reward. <clears throat> And if you are able and would care to stand with me again while we sing this song, get the blood circulating. There is room in the kingdom of God, my brother, for the small things that into the praetorium and it was early and they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled but might eat the Passover therefore Pilate went out to them and said what accusation do you bring against this man they answered and said to him if this man were not an evildoer we would not have delivered him to you so Pilate said to them Take him for yourselves, and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. To fulfill the word of Jesus, which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die, therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and this, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. 
that you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish then I release for you the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Morning, good to see you all here. Morning. As we're looking at Jesus, we're at the sec- section of his life where he's been on trial. We looked at the fact that he had been on trial before from the Jewish standpoint, and we had his Jewish trial and denial <laughs> that was illustrated to us by Peter, who just represented basically all the Jews at that time. And so now we have the trial of Jesus when it comes to the Gentiles, and also his denial as we take a look at it. Remember that Jesus is returning back to prepare the kingdom for believers. Jesus, the king, pays the sinner's debt. If Jesus is a king, why isn't he guilty of treason? Because certainly to claim yourself a king would make you guilty of treason in any country in which you live. And so as we begin to get back to this, I want you to understand that we're looking at John. And John doesn't cover everything that the other Gospels cover, nor nor do all the Gospels cover everything the other Gospels cover. If you put them all together, we would have more details, but we're just covering John. But I want you to understand that Jesus was basically tried six times. He was tried three times by the Jews and three times by the Gentiles. And so as we look at here at the Gentile trial, or at least the first part of it, remember that this is just a section or a part that we're looking at, as if you put them all together, there would be actually three times that Jesus tried and uh, questioned during this time. As you think about this section, I want you to remember Psalms 2 and verses 1 through 3. In Psalms 2, it's what's called a messianic psalm. In other words, it's a psalm or a song. Remember, that's what the psalms are. The psalms are songs. And it's a song about their king. And it has reference to Jesus. In Psalms 2 and verse 1, it says, Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising of vain things? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast their cords away. In other words, as God was writing hundreds of years before Jesus came, he pointed out that when Jesus was going to be rejected, he wasn't just going to be rejected by the Jewish nation, but he was going to be rejected by the world. And the Gentiles represent the world and the fact that they are going to reject him just like the Jews rejected Jesus. But he's handed over by the the Jews to the Gentiles. In verse 28 it says, this is all John... John chapter 18, verse 28 says, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium, and it was early, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. And so as you understand what's going on here, that they had condemned an innocent man, that they were going to kill Jesus, you have an amazing statement here of the fact that they led Jesus away to execution and of their hypocrisy. In Matthew 26 and verse 65, it says the high priest tore his robe after, after Jesus said that he was uh, the Christ. He, he has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They said he deserves death. So they brought him to, to the Gentiles because they wanted him put to death. That's what they wanted. And that's their Jewish hypocrisy. Because in Matthew 23 and verse 24, as Jesus was alive, Jesus spoke about the Jews of his day. Not every single Jew, but a lot of the Jews of his day, especially the the leaders and the rulers of his day. He said about them in verse 24, You blind guides who strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. Here you have... The Jews, the high priests, and the, uh, the Sanhedrin coming to the praetorium. The praetorium is simply the place where Pilate lives. And if you want an audience with Pilate, you have to go in there. But if you notice, they didn't go in there. 
They didn't want to go in there. It says that they came to the praetorium and they themselves did not enter the praetorium so that they would not defile themselves but might eat of the Passover. So they didn't want to go in to Pilate's house because if they went in there, they might come in contact with some leaven or come in contact with some, uh, some unclean person and therefore they would be unclean to go into uh, and celebrate the Passover. Yet, they're putting to death an innocent man. And you might say, well, how can they do that? How can they put an innocent man to death and yet think that they're going to be okay with God and be able to eat the Passover? Now, you remember what the Passover is, don't you? The Passover is that meal that celebrates the fact that God's people were delivered out of Egypt and in order for them to be delivered out of Egypt, they had to slay the Passover lamb and take the blood and put it on the door and when the death angel passed over the house he would pass over that house and the firstborn in that house wouldn't die and that's how the children of Israel were delivered and so the Passover represents their deliverance from from captivity and the reason they weren't to have any leaven in their house was because that represented their freedom from sin and yet they want to partake of the Passover they want to partake of that emblem but yet, they're putting to death Jesus. And you might say, how is that possible in their mind? And the answer is, because they were more concerned about the ceremony of the law than they were about the heart of the law. Remember the prophet Jeremiah? Jeremiah was sent to Israel. Actually, he was sent to Judah. When they were going to go off into captivity because of their idolatry. And when Jeremiah goes to them, rather than them recognizing their sin, they make this statement in verse 4 of Jeremiah 7. It says, Do not trust in deceptive words, saying, This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. In other words, what Israel was saying is, God's not going to destroy us because His temple is here. His ceremonial temple is here. That place that represents where, God's live, where God lives is here. And God certainly is not going to destroy that. Well, you remember what happened, don't you? They got carried off into captivity. You see, the Jews are coming to deliver this innocent man to, to Pilate to be condemned because they believe he should be condemned and killed. And yet, they think that they're going to be okay and fit to partake of the Passover. It didn't bother them to actually kill Jesus. In John 7 verse 19 it says, Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you carries out the law. Why do you seek to kill me? In John 8 and verse 37 it says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word is no place in you. And in Matthew 26 where we looked at, in verse, beginning at verse 3, it says, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas, and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they were saying, Not during the festival, otherwise a riot might occur among the people. And so here you have this hypocritical activity that's going on as they deliver Jesus to be killed and executed by the Gentiles. They, the Jews want to be ceremonially clean so they can partake of the Passover, but their internal part is immoral. But that shouldn't surprise you. It's like some Christians who think that they can go out and party on the weekends and get drunk and do all kinds of things that they shouldn't do, but they're okay because they can come to church on Sunday and ask God to forgive them. It shouldn't surprise you because it's like some husbands that go home and mistreat their wives and then they come to church and they think because they're coming to the church of Christ, the temple of the Lord, that everything's going to be okay. Or it's like some young people who come to church and they try to be faithful to God in church and they do all the right things, but then they go off and they partake of the things that, and the activity that the world does, and yet it doesn't bother them. And that's exactly what's going on with the Jewish community here with their leaders as they're crucifying or they want Jesus killed, this innocent man, 
so that they can preserve their own status and their own position. And so they said, we need to kill him, but not during the feast. So we need to make sure it happens before the Passover or before the actual sacrifice of the Passover happens. Because they're concerned about the ceremonial aspects of the law more than they are about the hard aspects of the law. And whenever anybody or any group of people become more concerned with the ceremonial part of the law than they do with the heart of the law, we've become guilty as the Jews had. And so they were even unwilling to go in. And what they failed to understand was God only accepts sacrifices based on one's character. Remember the story of Cain and Abel? You remember the story, right? I want you to read it real carefully with me. And I want you to notice why it is that God accepted the sacrifice of Abel, but didn't accept the sacrifice of Cain. It says in verse 3, so in Genesis 4, So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord and, the, and of the first fruit of the ground. And Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstling of the flock and of their fat portion. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. You see, we often switch the cart with the horse. And we often say that the reason why God accepted the sacrifice of Cain, of Abel, is that Abel offered the right sacrifice. And Cain offered the wrong sacrifice. And though that might be true, what you have to understand is the reason why Cain offered the right sacrifice, and the reason why I'm sorry, the reason why Abel offered the right sacrifice and the reason why Cain offered the wrong sacrifice was because of their hearts. You see, Abel offered the right sacrifice that God wanted because Abel wanted to do what God said. Abel wanted to be right with God. Cain offered the wrong sacrifice because he wanted God to accept his sacrifice. And that's what we need to understand. In Isaiah chapter 10, I'm sorry, in Isaiah chapter 1, as Isaiah is writing, and by the way, Isaiah was written to, the, to Israel and Judah when they're getting ready to go off into captivity, especially Israel, the ten northern tribes. And he's writing to them, and the prophet is preaching to them, and here's what he preaches to them. In, in Psalms, I mean in Isaiah chapter 1, and down here beginning at verse 10, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom, and give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now, I want you to understand something. He's not talking to Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah had already been destroyed. They're not even around anymore. He's talking to Israel, who are supposed to be his people. And he says, What? What are, your, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offering of rams and the fat of fed cattle. And I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires you this trampling of my courts? God says, who tells you to offer these things to me? They're worthless. Well, wait a minute. God told them to offer them. God set up the, court, the temple system. God set up the ceremonial system. God set it up for them and told them that they had to bring sacrifices if they wanted to be right with God. God's the one who set it up. But God's saying, who told you to do this? He says, when you come to appear before my court, who, court, who requires this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is abomination to me. New moons the Sabbath. And the calling of assembly, I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands to prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayer, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. You see, they might have been bringing the right sacrifices. But their hearts weren't right with God. 
And as a result of their hearts not being right with God, God was not going to accept their sacrifices even if they brought the right sacrifices. In Jeremiah 7, where we read verse 4, I want us to read the context of that. As they began to say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. In Jeremiah 7 and verse 3 it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words, saying this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you practice justice between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the alien, the, the orphan or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin, then I will uh, let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever. He says, Behold, you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, and swear falsely, and offer sacrifices to Baal, and walk after other gods that you have not known? Then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered, that we may do all these abominations. See, sometimes we misunderstand what church is about. Sometimes people think, I've got to find the right church so I can get right with God. Instead of understanding that we need to be the right church to be right with God. That we need to be individuals who serve God and who want to please God and serve Him and do His will. And so they wouldn't even go into Pilate's house. And by the way, it was early morning. It wasn't the time for judgments to be handed out, but they had to do this quickly because they had to get rid of Jesus quickly before the Passover. And so in verse 29, it says, Therefore Pilate went out, out to them and said, What accusations do you bring against this man? And they answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. Pilate comes out and says, What's the charge? You see, the Jews were under an assumption. The Jews were under the assumption that just if they brought somebody to Pilate and said, you need to kill him, that Pilate's going to go, okay, I'll kill him for you. And what we learn is sometimes the Gentile judgment is more righteous than the religious world. And so Pilate says to them, what did this man do? Even under Jewish law, it required two witnesses. In Deuteronomy 17 and verse 6, it says on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. Under Jewish law, you had to have two witnesses. Two witnesses had to be present in order to, to verify what was going on. In, ver in chapter 19 of Deuteronomy 15, it says a single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of, a, of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. And under Jewish law, not only did you have to have witnesses, but you actually had to have your accusers there standing in front of you. When Paul had been arrested, it says in Acts 25 and verse 16, I answered them that it is not the custom of the Romans to hand over any man before the accusers meet his, uh, the accused meet his accusers face to face and have an opportunity to make his defense against the charges. So Pilate comes out and says, what has he done? Tell me the crime. Show me the witnesses. Give me the evidence. I want to make sure I make a right judgment. And what did they charge him? What did they say? He's a criminal. If we didn't think he's a criminal, we wouldn't have brought him to you. But Jesus hadn't broken any civil laws. Matter of fact, the civil law that they thought he, he might have broke, he didn't even break that one. In Matthew 26 and verse uh, 59 through 66, we're going to start in verse 63, says, But Jesus kept silent as they were accusing him. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you. 
Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? And behold, they have now heard, uh, behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered, He deserves death. See, they couldn't come up with any charges for Jesus. They asked the people who heard Him. They, they, they looked at everybody and they couldn't find anybody who says, Oh yeah, He lied or He stole or He cheated or, or He's causing insurrection. Nothing. And so they just plainly asked Jesus, Are you the Christ? Are you the Son of God? And Jesus says, Yes, I am. And they said, Okay, then we're going to have crucified. You need to die. And so when they didn't give Pilate a charge, Pilate understood that he had no real grounds by which to condemn him. So he says to them in verse 31 and 32, Pilate says to them, take him out yourself and judge him according to your law. And the Jews said to him, we are not permitted to put anyone to death to fulfill the word of Jesus which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. Pilate said to them, you guys crucify him. Or, I'm um, sorry, Pilate said to them, you guys judge him. And so now we have the religious versus the civil. In Romans 13 and verse 1, God talking to his people says that there is a purpose for the civil. And he says in Romans 13, 1, he says, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is the minister of, uh, of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it, is, it, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. So the scriptures teach us that as individuals and as Christians, you and I live under the government that we live under. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that the government tells you to do something sinful, you're supposed to do it. That's true of, that's true of any government, any place. But God set up the government system on earth to provide for the judgment of things on earth. And so when Pilate says to them, you go and judge him yourself, they wanted him dead. And they weren't allowed to do that. But believers accept the civil government that we live under. Even sometimes when they have rules that we don't necessarily like. He says in Romans 13, 5, Therefore it is necessary to be in subjection not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. So when they come and say, Jesus is a criminal, and Pilate says, what has he done? Pilate wants to know. Has Jesus really violated the law? Maybe if he's, if he's causing insurrection or rebellion, maybe he's telling them not to pay taxes. But do you remember that very point came up in Matthew chapter 22? When they came to Jesus and they were trying to trap him, and they said, should we pay tax to Caesar or not? Remember that story? And you remember why, why they were trying to trap Jesus? Because they were thinking, if Jesus says that you don't pay tax to Caesar, then we can go tell Caesar and Caesar will come and take him away. If Jesus says that you pay tax to Caesar, then the Jews are going to stone him because the Romans are subjugating the Jewish community. And so they thought, whatever answer he gives, we got him trapped. But verse 21 of Matthew 22 says, and they said to him, after Jesus asked, show me a coin, and whose image is on the coin? They said to him, Caesar's. And then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And hearing this, they were amazed, and leaving him, they went away. You see, Jesus never did anything. Not only that the Jewish law wouldn't allow, but that civil law wouldn't allow. 
Jesus was completely innocent on both counts. And Jesus was carry, was carrying out God's will. That's why He was going to be crucified by the Gentiles. Verse 32 says, To fulfill the word of Jesus, which He spoke signifying by what kind of death He was to die. You know, the death that Jesus died was cruel. And the people who used that form of punishment were the Romans. And God, in order to prove that He was willing to save even the vilest of sinners, the ones who should be crucified, needed His Son to die in that way. To prove that it doesn't matter how bad your crime is, Jesus had paid for it. Jesus could have died all sorts of different ways. God could have let him die of old age. They could have just taken a knife and stabbed it in his heart and got it over with. There's a lot of ways he could have died. But this, this is the way God wanted him to die. And God wanted him to die this way to prove to us that maybe you have been so bad that you think the only thing that you deserve is the judgment of God and the judgment of man. God wants you to know, I paid the price for you. And my son has paid the price for you. God told him that this was going to happen. In Psalms 22 and verse 16, He says, For dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers have encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. When they crucified Jesus, they put Him on a cross. And they nailed His hands to the cross. And they nailed His feet to the cross. And His hands and His feet were pierced. In Isaiah 53 and verse 5 it says, He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. And by His scourgings we are healed. They brought Jesus to the Jew, to the Gentiles because the Gentiles had the worst form of capital punishment that anybody could have. You know, it's funny. We worry about whether our capital punishment that we do is humane or not because we don't want our, our person who's worthy of death and been accused and judged that he's worthy of death to be hurt as he dies. Not the Jews. They wanted him tortured and they wanted him suffering and they wanted him to die an agonizing death. And they wanted to do it in the public street as people would be coming into Jerusalem so that as people are coming in, they would go, why is that guy suffering that much? And they would look at the inscription written over his head and they would say, he's a thief. And if you were a thief, you took notice. Jesus was going to die this way. Because Jesus was dying for the vilest of sinners. Because through this activity, God was going to gather His people. In John 12 and verse 27, Jesus says, Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. And as you read that, you might think, yeah, when he's, when he's raised from the dead and goes up to heaven. No. Look at the rest of the verse. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he would die. What does that mean? What that means is that they would take Jesus and those people are going to be crucified and they have the cross laying on the ground. And they would take the cross laying on the ground and when they, lay, when they put Jesus on, on the cross, they would lay him down on the cross and they would nail him while he's on the ground, on the cross. And then they would take that cross and they would lift it up and drop it into the hole. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is telling them, by this agonizing death as a criminal, God will gather His people together. Zechariah talks about this in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 in figurative language. But let me see if I can explain it to you really quick. 
He said, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. You see, through Jesus we get grace and we can pray to God. He says, so that they will look on, him, on me whom they have pierced. God says, they're looking on me. They pierced me. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. Remember those people in Acts chapter 2? Those Jews who heard the message of Jesus and the fact that they had killed the Messiah? It says when they heard that Jesus was actually the king and was sitting at the right hand of God, that it said it pierced them to the heart. They were mourning. They were repentant. They were sorrowful. That's what's under consideration as he reads the rest of this about the Jews' reaction, the Jews' proper reaction. And when he talks about the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the inhabitants of the house of David, he's talking about the faithful. The wicked people don't care. The wicked people don't care how Jesus died. But those who are faithful, we see our punishment in the death of Jesus. And it says, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will, they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. In that day they will be, there will be great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning of uh, had a, uh, a Drimmon at, uh, in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn every family by, by itself and the family of the house of David by itself and their wives by themselves and the family of the house of Nathan by itself and their wives by themselves. And in other words, it's going to be an individual mourning. It's not going to be a national mourning like they had in Israel where they were saved as a nation. These people are going to be saved individually. And they're each going to mourn by themselves. The family of the house of the Levi by, by itself. And their wives by themselves. And the, fa and the family of uh, the Shemites by themselves. And their wives by themselves. All the families that remain. Every family by itself. And their wives by themselves. In other words, God says when they see Jesus hanging on that cross. And they understand that Jesus is the only means by which we can receive fellowship and acceptance with God. It's not by our own works. It's not by our own merit. Abel did have to offer a sacrifice. But his heart had to be right when he offered it. These people's heart is right when they offer the sacrifice of Jesus. They're mourning. They're repentant. They're sorry for their sins. And by Jesus dying on that cross will bring them to fellowship with God. And so Pilate questions Jesus about his kingdom. He says to him in verse 33 of John 18, Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative or did, did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? So Pilate goes inside to Jesus and says to Jesus, they're claiming that you're the king of the Jews. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 1, it says, Then the whole body of them got up and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay tax to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Now, if you're not sure what's going on here, let me tell you what's going on. Caesar rules the known world at this time. And Caesar rules with an iron fist. And if anybody claims to be a king that they're supposed to follow instead of Caesar, Caesar will bring his legion of armies and destroy them. And so they bring Jesus to Pilate and they say, He says he's a king. And he says not to pay tax to Caesar. Well, we already know that's a lie. They're not paying tribute to Caesar, we know is a lie. And so Jesus asked Pilate, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? In other words, what Jesus is asking Pilate is, Do you think that I am going against Caesar? 
Do you think that I am causing insurrection and I, that I'm going to revolt against Caesar? Did, did you find this out on your own? Because here's, here's, you here's what you need to remember. Pilate's job, one of Pilate's jobs was to make sure there wasn't some other guy running around claiming to be king. Pilate's job was to listen to all the political stuff that's going on. He was to listen to people who were becoming famous. He was to watch out for them to see if they were going to cause some kind of problems or rebellion. And if they were, he was to take his army and squash them. That was his job. Now Jesus had been preaching for three years. Do you think Pilate just heard about him just now? Do you think Pilate had people that were watching Jesus to see what he was doing, to hear what he was saying? Of course he did. Of course he was looking at, at Jesus. Of course he was examining what Jesus said. And for three years he had been doing that. And so when Jesus says to him, are you saying this on your own initiative? And in other words, have I been promoting myself to where I'm to be king and destroy Caesar? Is that what you've seen, Pilate? In Matthew 22 and verse 21, when Jesus asked them about paying, when they asked Jesus about paying taxes, they said to him, Caesar, the inscription, whose inscription is on it, and then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. You see, Jesus understood the principle that though we live in this world and we live under a physical government, there is somebody greater than that physical government that we must pay allegiance to. But it doesn't take away what the legal government does and what we're supposed to submit to in that legal government. Could you imagine how our world would be if we had no government at all? Who'd take care of your roads? Who'd make sure that your water you're drinking is pure? Who'd make sure that your house isn't going to fall down on you after you buy it? Who would put the criminals in jail? See, Jesus understood the principle that there is God that we serve, and while we're here, we serve under the civil government. And so Jesus never violated not only religious law, but He didn't violate civil law. <clears throat> this charge was from the Jews. Pilate said, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? <clears throat> you see, Rome hadn't noticed any insurrection. Because Jesus did what He commands us to do in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to kings as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by Him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. That's what Jesus did. Jesus did exactly the same thing that He commands of us. He was a good, faithful citizen under the Roman Empire. As long as they didn't violate, ask Him to violate what God wanted Him to do, He was faithful to the Roman Empire. <clears throat> and he even paid his taxes. You see, it was a Jewish charge. And why did they charge him? Because they had to find something to charge him with so the Romans would kill him. They couldn't just come and say, we don't like him. In Mark 14 and verse 61, it says, but he kept silent as they were asking Jesus about the charges that were being brought up against him that they couldn't prove. He kept silent and, didn't, and did not answer. And again, the high priest in the, was questioning him and saying, are you the Christ, the Son of the, of the Blessed One? Now here's what I want you to understand. If you are the Christ and you're the Son of the Blessed One, it's not a crime. <clears throat> and Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven and tearing their clothes. The high priest said, What further need do we have of we witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. <clears throat> you see, Jesus affirms that he is a king and that he has a kingdom. 
But what you need to understand is his kingdom is not the kingdom of the world. He says in verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said to him, So you are king. Jesus answered, You say correctly, I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. Jesus' kingdom is not of this realm. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus affirms he is a king. Remember Matthew 2? The wise men when Jesus was born? Remember why they came? It says in verse 2, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Jesus was born king of the Jews. Micah said, a prophet, But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. You see, he is a king. <coughs> and Jesus' kingdom is not physically maintained. How many of you remember some, hearing some of the stories of the Crusades? Remember hearing the stories of the Crusades? And the Inquisition? The Inquisition were, were uh, the, the Crusades were, were spiritual wars where the Pope and, and the Catholic Church would muster up an army and they would go fight against the Muslims who might have conquered Jerusalem or some other territory and they would go fight against them and they thought those were holy wars. Or the, or, or, uh, the Inquisition when the religious people would send out somebody to some place where they had a non-believer and they would try to force that non-believer to believe. <clears throat> that's what you do in physical kingdoms. In physical kingdoms, that's the way physical kingdoms work. <clears throat> if Don decided today to go out and rob banks, who's going who's to stop him? The physical government. They're going to come and stop him. <clears throat> Uh, by the way, don't, don't rob Bank of America. That's right, Bank. <clears throat> but Jesus says, that's not the way it works in my kingdom. That's not the way my kingdom is maintained. That's why in, in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12, Jesus said, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent men take it by force. People think the kingdom of God is something that you can force people into doing. You know why Caesar was ruler of the known world? Because he had a big stick called the Roman Legion. And you don't do what he said, he's going to come with his big stick and wallop on you. In Matthew 26 and verse 53, when Jesus was in the garden, you remember what he said? When he's being arrested? And Peter pulls out his sword and chops off the high priest's ear. I don't think he was aiming for his ear. He says in verse 53, Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? Jesus goes, If my kingdom was a physical kingdom, that was based on physical principles and physical rules, don't you think I could ask my father for angels and they'd come just wipe these people out? He says, that's not my kingdom. He says, my kingdom is not of this realm. Jesus says, my kingdom is not about this physical world and physical control over you. As God was prophesying about his kingdom, it says in Isaiah 9 and verse 6, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. 
There will be no end to the increase of his government or peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish it. The kingdom of God isn't a physical kingdom. That's why in Psalms 110, it says in verse 1, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool from, uh, for your feet. And just exactly how is the Lord going to do that? How is the Lord going to make the enemies into a footstool? In other words, how is, how is God going to subjugate his, his enemy to be his people and follow him? It says, The Lord will stretch forth uh, from, uh, your strong scepter from Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. How many of you volunteered to be an American citizen? Maybe some of you who came from a different country. But most of us were born here. We have to be. But in Jesus' kingdom, He doesn't force you. He doesn't make you. He invites you. Through grace and through mercy, He calls you to let God be your God and follow Him. And Jesus be the means whereby you get there. He says, Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are as your dew, uh, are, are to you as the dew. That's why God told Abraham, Abraham, your descendants are going to be like the stars of heaven. They're going to be so numerous. And so Pilate affirms that Jesus is a king. He says in verse 37, Pilate says to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answers, You have said correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus' kingdom is about truth. Let me tell you what's not truth, just in case you don't know. That there is no God who doesn't care about what's happening in the world. That's not the truth. That you can act any way you want to and there's nobody that you're responsible to. That's not the truth. That you can get right with God just doing whatever you want to do and just be a nice guy. That's not the truth. That the world just came by chance and you're here just by chance. That's not the truth. Jesus' kingdom is about truth. Jesus came because the devil had convinced the world that there is no God and that God doesn't love them and that you're on your own, so you better just be as powerful and as mighty as you can and take advantage, uh, uh, take a, a, advantage of any opportunity you have because it's all up to you. And Jesus came to speak the truth. In John 8 and verse 31 it says, So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in Him, If you continue in My word, then you are truly disciples of Mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I want you to understand something. There's some of you here that are captive to religious ritual and religious perfectionism. And you think that you're here because you found the right place, the perfect place, and because you found that perfect place, then that's going to make you right with God. And we haven't understood the rule of God in our hearts. But those who want truth come to Jesus. In John 3 and verse 21 it says, But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifest, that means rotten God. You want to know the truth? Then you've got to come to Jesus. Because he's the king of truth. He's the one who's going to tell you the truth. He's the one that knows the truth. In Proverbs 23 and verse 23 it says, Buy the truth and do not sell it. Get wisdom and instruction and understanding. 
In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22 and 23, it says, Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your soul for a sincere love of the brethren. Fervently love one another from the heart. For you, were, for you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. Why did we get baptized in Jesus? Because the truth is that unless we get baptized in Jesus and accept who Jesus is, we have no hope of eternal salvation. Abel not only had to have the right attitude, he had to offer the right sacrifice. It wasn't just enough for Abel to be a good guy. It was Abel had to have a desire to serve God and then offer to God what it was God wanted. If you've never been baptized in Jesus Christ to have your sins forgiven, then maybe you're over here with Abel being a nice guy. But you haven't quite accepted the rule of God in your life. You haven't mourned alone over the death of Jesus because of your sins. In 1 John 3 and verse 19 it says, We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our hearts before Him. In chapter 4 and verse 6 it says, We are from God. He who knows God listens to us and he who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And why do we want your nose in the book? Why do we want your nose in the Bible? Because that Bible is written by those people who were inspired by God who had the truth. By inspiration. That's why we want your nose there. And in chapter 5 and verse 20 he says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true. In His Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. What's the truth? There is a God. He loves you. He has a plan for your life. And he has a plan when you die. And he wants you to be part of it. And he doesn't want you to believe the world. He wants you to believe in his son. And so Pilate says to him, what is truth? That's a good question. What is truth? You listen to the media, you listen to online things, and you go, is that the truth? You listen when they tell you you wear a mask and you'll be taken care of. Is that the truth? They tell you take the vaccine and it'll help you and you won't die. Is that the truth? Believe this political party. Is that the truth? Who, who knows the truth? Polly did know one truth. He says, I know this man that you delivered to me is innocent. God is truth. In 1 John 4 and verse 6, it says, We are of God, and, have, and he who knows God listens to us, and he who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error in chapter 520. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Jesus is being crucified because the God of truth told us years ago that his son would be pierced. For our sins. And so Jesus' kingdom isn't a threat to Caesar. In Luke 23 and verse 4, then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. How many of you men are the king of your castle? Raise your hands, please. None of you? <laughs> We're supposed to be the king of our castles, right? <laughs> now, if you say you're the king of your castle, is the government going to come and take you away? No. Because that's a different realm. When Jesus said that he's the king of God and he's the king of the truth, that's a different realm. Pilate knew it. Pilate understood it. Jesus hadn't done anything wrong. And so Pilate attempts to set him free. Because like I told you, the Gentile judgment is often more righteous than the religious judgment. In John 18 and verse 39 it says, But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish that I release for you the king of the Jews? See, he was trying to let Jesus go off. At least let him free so that you know, he doesn't have to be killed because he's innocent. Matthew 27, verse 15 says, Now at the feast, 
The governor was accustomed to release for the, for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted. You see, he made a concession for them during their feast. I, you know, we re- arrest a lot of people, but on this day, to show you how compassionate we are, you pick one and we'll release him for you to show you how compassionate Rome is during your feast. In Luke 23 and verse 17 it says, Now he was obligated to release to them at the feast one prisoner. So he takes Jesus, this miracle worker, who cast out devils and healed people and raised the dead, and he puts him next to an insurrectionist and a robber and somebody who caused the community great trouble. Matter of fact, most commentators believe he was the leader of a gang. And so Pilate says in verse 40, or the people say, and they cried out again saying, not this man, not Barabbas, I'm sorry, not Jesus, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. The other references tell us that he was an insurrectionist. That he'd murdered people. And they have Jesus. And they have one of the worst sinners you have and they're standing side by side and they say crucify Jesus and the Jews condemned him in John 15 10 it says for he was aware Pilate was aware that the chief priest had handed him over because of envy and you might be looking down on the Jewish community and you, go, and you might be thinking to yourself how terrible and how awful they were but here's what you need to remember this had to be done because you sinned because you lied because you stole because you committed adultery because you cheated because you disobeyed the civil government because you were hooked on drugs And Jesus did this to deliver us. But we had to understand that though he was a king, he wasn't guilty. But Barabbas was. In Matthew 27, verse 15, it says, Now at the feast of the the governor was accustomed to release for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted. And at that time there was holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was because of envy they had handed him over. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. God's word returns to prepare a place, a kingdom for believers. And though Jesus the king paid the debt of a criminal, he was innocent. And those who believe the truth of Christ are baptized in him to be made acceptable for the kingdom of God. And if we can aid or help you in any way, maybe you want to study more, let us know. However we can help, we ask you to come forward. We'll be here to be standing. The kingdom of the blood pass away one by one, but the kingdom of God remains. It is built on a rock, and the Lord is the king, and forever and ever he reigns. It shall stand, it shall stand.
love everybody in here. Amen. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you, Father, for bringing us here today to worship you, to be with one another, to learn your word, Father. We ask you, Father, to instill what we heard today on our hearts. And may it change our lives and hopefully give us the strength to help somebody else change their lives, Father. For you are the, you are the number one worker, and we cherish you, and we praise you, and we ask you, Father, to uh, put your arm protection around this congregation. We ask you, Father, to take care of all the shut-ins, the ones that are sick, the ones that are traveling, Father. We ask you to put a hedge of protection around them, going and coming, Father. We ask you, Father, to continue to bless us and to keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Just a reminder about kids' camp. Uh, if you can, make sure you let us know if your kids are coming or if your children or your grandchildren so we can make sure and be prepared. Let me give you a couple of announcements. Uh, I just got a card, uh, and it says that Mary needs a ride home. She lives about 10 minutes away. So if somebody can give Maria a ride home, uh, where's Maria? I don't know. That's what it says. Maria needs a ride home. She lives about 10 minutes away. Uh, also, Elaine has been working with, with, some, with the family, and apparently they need a place to stay for the next couple of weeks. And so you need to talk with Elaine about that. If you are in a position where you can um, put them up or uh, help with taking care of them for the next two weeks, I think after that they will have a place to stay, I believe. And so see, see Elaine about that. Um, And then uh, Erlinda would like to thank everybody for their prayers and their cards uh, and their well wishes. Uh, and God has taken care of them and has blessed them, and, and they just wanted me to mention that. Uh, is there any other announcement that was told to me that I have overlooked? All right. And just real quick, uh, remember Carolyn and Faye in your prayers, if you would, keep them in your prayers. Uh, as far as being sick, Randy and Barbara are, are better, and they're, they're getting better. I was hoping they'd be here today. Uh, but I, I don't see them. Uh, ladies' fellowship is immediately after services. I remember that Roy is, uh, uh, Leroy is looking for people to go with him to visit people. Uh, next Sunday evening, we're having a so song and prayer service. And also you have a flyer for a song service at Carmichael on the 30th. That's a Saturday. Uh, and this is, this is a five-Sunday month. And on the fifth Sunday, if you'd like to preach for us, let us know. And we'll be happy to, to arrange that for you. Uh, there's also the uh, servant's. Uh, the, the men's servants meeting right after the, the service today. Any other announcements need to be made that I don't know about? Good to see you all here. Pray the Lord blesses I, you. Yes. Randy and Barbara 